Um, sorry, hello, my name is Carl Garvey. Thanks, Asa, for introducing everything. Um, this is me and my natural environment. Um, <laughs> I actually do wear those clothes for environmental reasons, but the, dra the drama helps. Um, so, <clears throat> as Asa introduced, I am from Cork in Ireland. I am the only guy in Ireland who is actually doing this, although there are other people interested. So I, I love coming over and meeting all these people. It's great. It's like a, my social outing of the year. Um, <laughs> I, um, I had got into this years ago while I was surviving a derailing PhD, which I, ju I jumped the train. I was like, no, this is, this is way, more, way more interesting than what I'm doing. And, um, you know, that sort of distracted PhD uh, effect led me to get really obsessed on this. I was just, you know, really digging into the, the Google groups and the, you know, blog posts of DIY Bio and saying, why am I not doing this? You know, I, I kind of stopped and went, I went and did genetics. I knew I wanted to do genetics since I was 11, which was longer ago than, you may, than I, it may appear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I, I knew I wanted to do genetics for years, and then I went to do genetics, and by the time I was at the other end, I was thoroughly institutionalized. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to do a PhD for a couple of years, and then I'm going to postdoc it up and abase myself before the system, and maybe someday, maybe, I'll be able to beg someone for money to do something I don't really want to do. And then I saw these people out there, and they're just like, yeah, I'm going to base them, and I'm going to make things glow in the dark and stuff, and give it away at events. Yeah, take these, take these bacteria home and bleach them, you know, like, uh, it's just doing what they want to do. And I was like, hey, that's what I wanted to do. I just want to do whatever the hell I want and have fun and do biotech. Now, it's not all that utopian, but I have had a lot of fun. Um, so, basically what I did was, I, I had already set up a lot of uh, lab equipment and a, a little bit of a lab at home in my spare time. And I kind of said, I'm, I'm going to see where I can take this. I'm going to see can I actually set up a little open source hippie biotech company and try and provide things that people like at a fair price without these patents. And actually, that's something I'm going to rant about at you all in a while. So yeah, this is me. This is where you can kind of, you know, harass me if you don't like what I'm saying. And uh, this is the kind of stuff that I'm into. So if you don't like it, you can just stop listening now. Um, so some stuff that I've done, which I, I think is great. I love it. Um, so I actually, I, I have a terrible habit of fiddling, so you may have already noticed me kind of like fiddle around. Um, one of the things that I did first, which really kind of cemented my interest, was at the time I was playing around with a 3D printer, which has been thoroughly neglected in the last year and a half. But um, I was I working in a lab, and I could see the price of this stuff. It's really expensive, and that's the first thing a lot of academic and industrial biotech guys will say to you. How can you do this at home? How can you make a hobby? Biotech is expensive. The other one is biotech is hard. Both of which are kind of, they're just problems to be solved. Computers are hard, but they're really easy these days, because other people have done all the hard work for you. Um, and I was like, okay, centrifuges, they're just a glorified motor with a thing you shove on top and put tubes into, and you can use them to do almost anything. They're critical lab equipment. You spin stuff really fast, like a salad spinner, to get rid of stuff you don't want or to keep stuff you do. And actually, we were, some guys are using a salad spinner as a centrifuge over there, so yeah, it, the, the system works. But I was like, okay, we need a good, fast one that can go fast enough to get DNA out, to get cell, you know, bacterial cells out of culture. And I had a Dremel, and I had a 3D printer, and it just kind of occurred to me, yeah, okay, let's just slap a rotor on a Dremel. So I printed one out, and traditionally, a centrifuge second-hand will cost you like 300 quid. First-hand is well over 1,000. And for one euro's worth of plastic, you can, if you have a 3D printer handy, you can print your own one of these. Open source, none of this patent nonsense. Um, and if you don't have a 3D printer handy, I sell them online. Uh, all, all proceeds go to biohacking, and um, you know it, it's about sixty quid for the rotor. Uh, well, it depends on your location. I can't give, I, I, and that's sixty euro. Um, so I, I can't give like figures. But combined with a cheap Dremel that you can get like almost anywhere, um, you've got yourself a lab-grade centrifuge. It goes well fast enough to do DNA, bacteria, everything I've ever needed to do. Um, other stuff just for fun, like isolating bioluminescent bacteria, was something that the guys were doing at Lab Easy before I arrived. I got to miss that lovely smelly glow-in-the-dark bacteria. What happened? Was Did you touch I was talking about my bacteria. Uh, <laughs> I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> this man trying to keep me down. Um, so yeah, like, it's, 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 it's relatively easy to isolate bacteria from fresh seafood. So I went into the English market, um, bought myself some, it's like we have an English market in Cork. I uh, bought myself a, a rotting squid, it wasn't rotting when I bought it, and isolated um, glow the bacteria from it. And I had these lovely little jars on the back of the picture. Have you switched the mic off? Um, <coughs> might have been my fault. <laughs> no. Oh wait, here we go. 
Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you switched it off. It's like the natural state of microphone to make noise. Right. Huh? No, it's running out of battery. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Keep speaking into it. Uh, the <laughs> battery is flashing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Lance on this one. How are you doing? Just carry on speaking. Try speaking. I'm good at that. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is a picture of my lab, and um, you know I've got more or less all the kind of lab equipment that I need, but it's obfuscated from sight. Like that, that box there is my incubator. Uh, my centrifuge is that you know uh, vice grip with a, a Dremel shoved in, and this that I brought over for the lab easy. Although I lost the I lost the vice in um, Edinburgh, and uh, you know Bunsen burner on a on a gas cartridge and everything. So like you can get all this equipment online, make it yourself, hack it, or just buy it from other biohackers. But this is like a fully functional molecular biology lab where I can do genetic engineering and have done. Um, you know, as an example of the kind of stuff you knock together, PCR machines are expensive. They have, a, they have one over here that's 600 euro and is officially, I think, the, oh, the cheapest one on sale at 600 euro, or dollars, sorry, in currency. But like here's one I knocked together for like 50 quid out of an old coffee can and an artist's heat gun. So you can make lab equipment very cheaply. Um, here's some other stuff, like I'm trying to come up with a, a, a suite of methods, protocols we call them, but just recipes, you know, for how to do stuff as, com as simple as growing bacteria, which you can do by just forgetting about your dinner for a while, or uh, as complicated as actually genetically engineering stuff, but by avoiding all of the awkward ingredients that most lab protocols assume you have. So this is where people think it's difficult if they do it themselves. They come out of a lab and they're like, but where are you going to get your polyethylene glycol 3350? Good luck. <laughs> um, where are you going to get the polyethylene glycol 3350? That's a chemical. Um, and that is Miralax, a common over the counter laxative. It's almost pure polyethylene glycol 3350. Mm. So when I ordered one kilogram of the stuff, the guy who was delivering it was looking at me with pity, but. This <laughs> <laughs> was science. Science. Um, and like, you can buy most of the stuff necessary to do these things just in the local pharmacy or off a eBay shop. Um, and like, there are things like enzymes which can be hard to buy online, but this up here is a picture of. The ingredients necessary to purify lysozyme, a common lab enzyme, you use 40% proof alcohol, vodka, and egg white. And you mix them together, leave them precipitate for a while, dilute, filter, dry out, lysozyme. Great, no problems. So like, you can get around all these difficulties. You can make water baths out of kettles as well, and they make mean inside-out eggs. Hard yolks, soft whites, really strange, very tasty. <laughs> Try it. Um, but besides just the fun and the, you know, like hacking for the laugh and hacking for out of necessity and all this, uh, what I'm actually trying to do is create open source DNA to make it easy for anyone to just go home and say, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to make something crazy. And this is, again, where people say, it's hard. It fails all the time and you need antibiotics and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to make, uh, for, for starters, now this, people are sick of hearing me talk about this because the first rule of biotech is it never works the way you want it to. So I've been hacking away at this thing for ages and I've moved on to other things since when I get it working. But the idea was, all right, why can't you just take a bacteria that grows in everyone's backyard, although use a lab stream, um, and you have an open source piece of DNA that you can shove your project into that doesn't need antibiotics, that doesn't have any patents attached, that's really stable as it comes, and that uses household ingredients like sugar to help establish a culture of genetically modified bacteria, whereas you traditionally use antibiotics. And um, it, it actually partially works. Partially. I'm still working on it. But you know, this is the kind of thing I want to focus on. I want to focus on stuff that's designed for home users to do bio. And the goal is, you know, the kind of freedom to tinker and freedom in biology and the freedom to know yourself by studying DNA. But they asked me, what do you want to talk about today? We come up an issue, with an issue, and I'm like, oh, I've got plenty of issues. But the one that bothers me is IP, intellectual property. The idea that you can own ideas, but worse, that you can own naturally occurring DNA. Some people in the crowd may not yet be aware that most of their DNA, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, but it's usually over 50%, doesn't belong to you. You're not allowed, in, in, in America, you're not even allowed to look at it. In Europe, you're allowed to look at it for personal use. But it's patented, so you can't do anything else with it. It doesn't belong to you. It's your DNA, you were born with it, it was given to you by your parents and their grand, your grandparents, not yours. And I think that's disgusting, because it's natural. Nobody invented it. Even if patents should be allowed, they should only be allowed in inventions. And there's a strong political element to bio, biotechnology, because 
Biotech is fundamentally how we feed ourselves, clothe ourselves, and cure ourselves. And by allowing things like IP, and by scaring people into thinking that biotech is unnatural or scary or this new thing and that only Monsanto does biotech, we create a circumstance where only the big guys can play in biotech. We're left completely powerless. And this is the stuff that keeps us alive and keeps us in our lifestyle, but it doesn't belong to us anymore. So, like, you know, censored DNA, you can't actually even read your DNA in America, at least we don't have that problem here, but, you know, that's a, a big problem. The DNA you have in yourselves isn't yours. And, you know, there are a lot of art projects focusing on this, like the Peace Peace project. So, you know, how are they going to police this? We're all alive, all the stuff around us is alive. What are they going to do? Like, come in and serve us DMCA notices for copying our own DNA? Um, and, you know, this idea where the police will be using bees to, se to seek out genetically modified crops in the city. Um, and I actually deal with this all the time because, well, okay, so the next thing is like, you know, biopathics can inhibit really good stuff. Like bioart is one of them, you know, knowing yourself, your DNA gel, your DNA fingerprint. Um, but also, like, this up here is a plate full of GFP, green fluorescent protein, and variants in different colors. It's been around for almost 20 years, um, or slightly more in case of just basic GFP. And we use it all the time in research. If you want a quick marker, is your DNA in the cells? You can slap in GFP as well as whatever else you're doing, and the cells will then become fluorescent. So it's a nice marker that stuff is going well. But it's almost all patented. All those colors are patented. Uh, the really vibrant versions of GFP are patented. The versions that are stable are patented. So for me, to do even the most basic stuff in genetics, GFP is considered your hello world. That's what you did in, in, in America, GFP and cells. It's just so normal. It's called the hello world, the first thing you do when you join synthetic biology or do anything. And it's all patented. And that inhibits art, it inhibits science, it gets in the way of everything. And then down here we've got golden mice. This is more than art. This is survival for some people. Um, this was a project and it was stymied for years by patents. They had to beg, beg all these companies, can we please use your patents? It's not for profit. We can't give you license. We can't give you... Uh, you know, royalties, we can't pay for this, because we're trying to provide a strain of rice which has loads of beta carotene to stop people going blind. And it took them years. Nobody would give them any licenses. And eventually they got it out there, and by then Greenpeace had been telling everyone, it'll kill you, it'll turn you into a monster. So people are still going blind and eating standard rice which has no beta carotene. And there's so much in golden rice, it's actually golden. It could be solving a real problem. And patents kept it back so many years that, you know, it's just never going to happen now. Um, and I deal with this all the time myself because I'm trying to design DNA. And this is what I should be doing over here. I should be going through the design cycle where I say, okay, I've got an idea, let's see, can I make it happen? If it works, then cool. If it doesn't, I'll keep trying until I can get a version that works. And then I can put it out there and the world benefits. You can take my idea and do something else with that idea. You know, it's great. This is the reality, you know? I mean, you actually have to be, you have to beg permission if you can even find the guy who owns the idea. And that's challenging in the first place. How do you find the guy who owns your idea? You have a great idea. Oh, that's, that's ingenious. You go online. Now there's Google patents, but now you, know, you need to know what to look for. And you might find some other guy has had the same idea, patented it, did nothing with it, left it on the shelf, and is just waiting for someone else to try it so he can sue the pants off them. Uh, they call them patent trolls. And there are loads of patent trolls in biology. A lot of them are universities, so you think they're you know, great for in intellectualism, and then you know, this is what happens. But in the best case scenario, you still have to beg like a thousand guys to use their different patents, share so many royalties with them that you'll never be able to make even a little cottage industry out of this. And unless you can get someone to pay for a free product just to make it happen, that's the end of a good idea. So like, patents are what I wanted to rant about because they make my life very difficult. I waste days of good research just digging through these things and trying to understand the opaque nonsense that they call disclosure so that I can tell, is this guy gonna kill me if I try and come up with something cool or can I just do it? And that is, that, that's my rant. This is, the, this is what I don't like because it ruins my, my day. And yeah, you know, eventually, even if everything works out, some other guy whose patent you didn't notice can sue you and you die in a fire. So, <laughs> <laughs> patents, that's my bugbear. Um, so. <laughs>